joining us today our week for our weekly Bible studies for life series. This week, the lesson is entitled The Benefit of Spiritual Disciplines. So who wants to get stronger? No, no, I wouldn't really care about that. Now, that's really an easy yes, but I think our first thoughts probably go to the physical strength. We all want to be physically stronger, and I'm sure mentally stronger as well. But what about our spiritual strength? First of all, how often do we think about our spiritual strength? And secondly, what are we going to do about it? Today, we're going to introduce a series of lessons on spiritual disciplines by discussing the need for and the benefits of spiritual disciplines. First, let's define spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are those practices found in the scripture that promote spiritual growth in the believer's lives and produce fruit. Examples would be prayer, reading and studying the word, fellowship, confession, fasting, and serving, to name a few. There are no comprehensive list of spiritual disciplines found in a certain chapter and verse in the Bible. They are gleaned throughout the scripture and are mentioned multiple times in the Bible. The purpose of spiritual disciplines is to help the believer be formed from the inside out into the image of Christ. The goal is to become Christ-like. You'll hear that term several times today in this lesson. Dr. Don Whitney wrote a very well-known book on spiritual disciplines titled Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. In that book, he describes several characteristics of spiritual disciplines that I will discuss today. First, the Bible mentions both personal and interpersonal spiritual disciplines. There are those spiritual disciplines we practice alone, and those we practice with other believers. For example, we pray alone. That is a personal spiritual discipline. We also pray together with the church. That is an interpersonal spiritual discipline. A second characteristic of spiritual disciplines is they are activities. Spiritual disciplines are those things that we do. However, the goal of practicing any given discipline is not about doing as much as it is about being, becoming like Jesus, becoming, being with Jesus. I'll give you a warning here. We need to be careful because we are all tend to be better at doing than being. So we're going to try to talk about that concept a little more. Jesus, uh, the Bible, but the biblical way to grow in being more like Jesus is through the rightly motivated doing of the biblical spiritual disciplines. Recall the definition of spiritual disciplines as those practices found in the scripture that promote spiritual growth in the believer's lives and produce fruit. For example, we know that joy is not a spiritual discipline. It is a fruit of the spirit. Therefore, when joy is evident in our life, it is a result of a discipline done rightly. There is more to the Christian life than belief. There is an ongoing action and character development required for a life to be fully, to fully be a testament to the gospel. A third descriptor of the spiritual disciplines is that we are talking about things that are practices taught or modeled in the Bible. This is important because otherwise we leave ourselves open to calling anything we want a spiritual discipline. For example, someone might say to you that exercise is a spiritual discipline for me or gardening or any other hobby we might participate in. The problem there is it leaves it to us to determine what will be the best for our spiritual health rather than accepting those things God has revealed in the scripture as means of growing in Christ's likeness. A fourth description of spiritual disciplines is that those are found in the scripture are sufficient for knowing and experiencing God, and for growing in Christ's likeness. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for the reproof, for the correction, and for the training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That includes the good work of growing in Christ's likeness. The scriptures are sufficient for that. Later, when we read the text of the lesson for today, Paul will expose 
how false teaching teachers are continually trying to change or reinterpret what the scriptures say or mean. Another characteristic of spiritual disciplines <clears throat> is they are means and not ends. Therefore, we are not godly just because we practice the spiritual discipline. That was the great error of the Pharisees. They felt by doing these things, they were godly. No, spiritual disciplines are means to godliness. You recall earlier the warning about just doing, okay? Spiritual disciplines intentionally create a space in your life where you allow God to form your inward life into the nature of Christ. Let me read that again. Spiritual disciplines intentionally create space in your life where you allow God to form your inward life into the nature of Christ. The spiritual discipline does not form you. God does. For example, fasting won't make you more spiritual. But if, we, but if it opens up that space for you to get closer to God, then there's the possibility for God to make you more Christ-like. Lastly, spiritual disciplines are relational, non, not transactional. Because they are a list of activities, we often think of things as think of them as things to be done to check off our list. We're all good at making lists and, and uh, completing the task. Remember, they're about doing, about, excuse me, they're about being, not about doing. Imagine this scenario if I walk in and said to my wife, dear, we're supposed to talk every day. And so let's sit down and talk for 30 minutes. I, that'll make you happier with me. So how do you think that conversation is going to go? Not very well. However, because I love my wife and I want to have a relationship with her, I look forward to regularly sitting down and having a meaningful conversation which can build the relationship. I think you kind of understand that through that. Spiritual discipline certainly cost us time and energy, but the cost of not being disciplined is always greater. If we want to get better at any discipline, it requires some type of regular activity. The best example is to become more physically fit, we must exercise, and we need to choose the right exercise and schedule for maximum results. Similarly, if we want to be spiritually fit, we must routinely engage in spiritual disciplines. The question is, do we pursue spiritual disciplines as a priority? Essentially here, we, can't, we, we know that if we're going to do physical exercise once a month is not going to get us in shape, even probably once a week. So we've got to come up with a routine. I would say that there has never been a more urgent time for believers to get in spiritual shape. Followers of Christ are under attack for no other reason than they identify as a Christian. We can no longer put this off, and I would suggest that we have to have a plan. You're probably familiar with the quote, if we fail to plan, we're planning to fail. Therefore, when we neglect the spiritual disciplines, we make ourselves much more susceptible to the influences of the world. Our spiritual strength is low. Our ability to detect and overcome the temptations and the deceptions of Satan are compromised. There is no doubt about it. There is a battle for your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says it this way, above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. If the enemy takes over your heart, then your life is his. The only road to spiritual maturity and godliness passes through the spiritual disciplines. Let me read that again. The only road to spiritual maturity and godliness passes through the spiritual disciplines. There is no detour. In the next five weeks, we will talk about specific spiritual disciplines and the implications of each one in greater detail. First, let's look at a very serious warning and an admonition from Paul in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 10. That'll be our text for the day. The setting is 1 Timothy was written by Paul to Timothy to counter some false teachings 
that were at the church of Ephesus. Let me open up with the uh, first three verses in 1 Timothy 4, uh, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Through the hypocrisy of their lies, whose conscience are seared, they forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. The scripture truth clearly states that the faith of believers will be tested. Unfortunately, Paul says some will pay attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Due to the reality of false teachings, the apostle John encouraged believers to test the spirits to see if they were from God. First John 4 verses 1 and 2 says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Clearly, the best test is to see if their messages match up with what God's word states. However, to be able to test the message, we must know the word, which is one of the essential spiritual disciplines, reading and studying the word. Furthermore, these false teachers speak with great authority, using words like forbid and demand. They willingly distort the truth and make claims that the scriptures don't support. Paul says it this way, they are liars with no conscience. The, the, the examples Paul used is they forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude. Again, by having knowledge of the scriptures, we can recognize this as false teaching. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus clearly endorses marriage. Also, remember the setting of Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding feast. Furthermore, Jesus taught in Mark chapter 7, verses 18 through 23, that it isn't what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out. In this teaching, Jesus is declaring all foods clean. Paul continues these thoughts in 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 through 7. Let me read those. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teachings that you have followed, but have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Verse four and five, Paul continues to emphasize that everything created by God is good. Verse six, Paul admonishes Timothy to point out these false teachings to the believers and you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Timothy is able to share the truth because he has received good teaching. This is certainly a reminder that we must seek out good word-based teaching to build on our faith. Next, Paul reminds Timothy to be disciplined and not lured into even considering those absurd and unsupported ideas. Paul calls them pointless and silly myths. For our final scripture reading today, we will continue in 1 Timothy. We're going to read the last three verses of uh, 7 through 10. Rather, train yourself up in godliness, for the training of the body has limited benefit, but the godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. For this reason, we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Paul is saying here, he says, rather train, instead of listening to the false teachers and giving them any attention, he says, we need to spend our time training in godliness. This is where the spiritual disciplines that we discussed in the opening of the lesson are practiced. Practiced. The word train 
suggests that becoming Christ-like will take action with effort. Yet Paul says it will be beneficial in every way. How often do we invest energy and time into something that is 100% beneficial? Paul does, does differentiate between physical training, which he says has limited benefits, because as we know, it will only last for this earthly existence. And for sure, you're fighting a losing battle against aging. Sorry to say. No matter how hard you train. However, spiritual, tra spiritual disciplines training hold promise for the present life and eternity. A couple of thoughts on spiritual training for the present life. It will surely strengthen us to stand against persecution and false teaching. Also, on a more offensive, uh, offensive posture, becoming more Christ-like will prepare us to disciple others more effectively. This becomes our opportunity to walk alongside other Christians in different parts of their spiritual journey to help them become more Christ-like. Finally, Paul states it pretty affirmatively, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. What else can I say? So we ask the question, so what? The benefits of spiritual discipline are right in front of us. And as we train to increase our spiritual strength and share that, we have the opportunity to share that with others. Again, remember that the only road to spiritual maturity and godliness passes through spiritual disciplines. I would encourage you to join us in the next five weeks as we walk through the specifics of several spiritual disciplines. I look forward to studying these with you together, and I certainly thank you for your time. May God bless you.